Okay. Um, part two of the ancient Hebrew wedding model. Uh, last week, we actually just went through the basic ceremony, what occurred, and it, it should have brought out loads of little scriptures and made you go, ah, I, re I remember this. This is what he was on about. And then in the second half of last week, we kind of uh, looked at examples of this ancient Hebrew wedding model in scripture. Uh, for example, when uh, Yitzhak's wife was chosen or the marriage of uh, Jacob with the two sisters, uh, Leah and Rachel. This week, we're going to put Yeshua in the center of the picture, and we're going to start looking at how this explains things to do with the Moedim, with the appointed times. Um, I will go as far as saying you won't have a full depth of understanding of the Moedim if you don't understand the ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony. So... Let's just quickly recap what the ceremony was. First, you had Shiduchin, which was the matchmaking stage. Um, this is when the match between a husband and a wife were made, and this was usually done by the parents, particularly the fathers. Um, this is when the terms of the covenant would be hashed out. So this is what your son is going to provide for my daughter, and this is how my daughter will be a good wife for your son. These types of things. Then we had erusin, which is the betrothal stage. So the bride and groom would undergo the mikveh, uh, bapt immersion. Uh, this was once all the terms of covenant were agreed upon. Uh, by the end of shiruchin, there would have been a formal proposal, and that formal proposal would have been accepted or denied. Uh, once it was accepted, bride and groom undergo a mikveh, and this is when you would have the betrothal ceremony. And the groom would give a matan, the bridal gift. <laughs> I realized that last week, I, I, it was matan for the first half of the teaching, and then I went to chatan, don't ask why, one of them weeks, <laughs> it's matan. Um, and then there was the signing of the ketubah, the marriage contract. Then there would have been a covenantal meal and a cup of wine. Uh, this would have been ceremonial. Then we have, the, so you would have had the year break then. The, the groom goes off and prepares a place for his wife in his father's house. When the father of the groom said, now is the time, son, go get your bride, the Nisuin would ensue. The groom comes to take his bride home, announced by his two witnesses, and it would have been with the blast of a shofar. The finalization of the vows and then a cup of wine between bride and groom and then there would have been the consummation. Then there would have been the seven-day wedding feast. So that's just the recap of what actually went on. We saw how Elohim chose his bride in the seed of Abraham very early on. This is when this was the Shiduchin, I choose you. He gave Abraham the stipulations of the covenant. What Elohim would do for Avraham, he would give him land. He would make his descendants like the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. And he gave Avraham what he wanted in return. And that was to walk before me and be perfect, to have integrity. Elohim gave Avraham a matan, a gift of a son in his old age. However, the bride was too young to consummate. She hadn't reached maturity. When the bride was mature enough, i.e. when the nation of Israel was born at Mount Sinai, Elohim reaffirmed who he had chosen. He, sa he says, I, am, I, I have chosen you not because of your righteousness and your numbers, but because of the promises I made to your forefathers. He reaffirmed what the stipulations of the covenant would be both of bride and groom. So to us, he gave the Torah. This is what he wants us to do. And in return, if we obey his Torah, he will bless us. We saw how Mount Sinai was a perfect type and shadow of an ancient Hebrew wedding. Eventually, Yisrael went to the place that Elohim had prepared for them, i.e. the land. However, the bride was not faithful. We know that things soon went pear-shaped not long after. In Jeremiah 2, it says, The word of Yah came to me, saying... 
Go and you shall cry in the hearing of Yerushalayim, saying, Thus says Yah, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your bridehood, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. So he's pointing back to the Exodus and Mount Sinai. Yisrael was set apart to Yah, the first fruits of his increase. All who ate of it became guilty. Evil came upon them, declares Yah. Hear the word of Yah, O house of Yaakov, and all the clans of the house of Yisrael. Thus said Yah, what unrighteousness have your fathers found in me, that they have gone far from me and went after worthlessness and became worthless? And did they not say, where is Yah, who brought us up out of the land of Mitzrayim, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of desert and pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, a land that no one had passed through and where no one dwelt? Then I brought you into a garden land to eat its fruit and its goodness. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my inheritance an abomination. For of old, you have broken your yoke and tore off your bonds. And you say, I am not serving you, when on every high hill and under every green tree you lay down a whore. Remember, he's using husband and wife uh, analogy. This is, it's... It's spiritual adultery of the highest order. Ezekiel picks up on this, saying, Again, the word of Yah came to me, saying, Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations, and say, Thus said the master Yah to Jerusalem, Your origin and your birth are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your birth, on the day you were born, your navel cord was, cut not, was not cut. And nor were you washed in the water for cleansing, and you were not rubbed with salt at all, nor wrapped in cloth at all. No, I felt sorry for you to do any of these for you, to have compassion on you, but you were thrown out in the open field, the loathing of your life on the day you were born. Then I passed by you and saw you trampled down in your own blood. And I said to you, in your blood, live. And I said to you, in your blood, live. I would argue this is when he's, he pulled him out of Egypt. I have let you grow like a plant in the field, and you are grown and are great, and you come in the finest ornaments. Breasts were formed, your hair grew, and you were naked and bare. We see he's using this analogy of a woman maturing, a girl coming into full maturity. Again I passed by you and looked upon you and saw that your time was the time of love. She was of marital age. And I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. And I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, declares the Master Yah. This is marriage language. This um, entering into the covenant and Israel becoming his, he's saying, I married you. And what gives it away is this spreading of the skirts, as we'll see. He's saying that he entered into a marriage covenant. And what's amazing is that you see... Elohim watching this woman, this girl, maturing to the age where she's now of marital age. This is like when he chose Abraham's seed. The bride wasn't mature. Ruth chapter 3, verse 8. It came to be at midnight that the man was startled, this is Boaz, and turned himself and saw a woman lying at his feet. And he said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your female servant. Now you shall spread your covering over your female servant, for you are a redeemer. We know the story that Ruth was asking to be married into Boaz because he was the kinsman redeemer. And this is where this um, spreading the skirt over, it was a euphemism for coming under the covering of the man. And he said, blessed are you of Yah, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, not to go after young men, whether poor or rich. And I washed you in water, and I washed off your blood, and I anointed you with oil. And I dressed you in embroidered work and gave you sandals of leather, and I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. Again, so, who gets to be covered in fine linen? The bride, the righteous. We're going to see this play out more so in the second half. And I adorned you with ornaments and I put bracelets on your wrists and a chain around your neck. 
and I put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ears and a crown of adorning on your head. Now, if you understand the ancient culture, you'll know what's going on here. All these is what a groom would give to his bride. And we actually saw this, some of these, last week. This is how the brides were adorned on their wedding day. They were known as the king and queen for that day, by the way, the bride and the groom, because it was their day. This is where this idea of the crowns come from. For those of you who, when we covered it last week, in Genesis 24, 22, this is when Abraham's servant meets um, the Rebekah at the well. And it came to be when the camels had finished drinking that the man took a gold nose ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her wrists weighing 10 shekels of gold. It's the same items. And in Revelation 2, 10, be trustworthy until death and I shall give you the crown of life. Revelation 3.11, see I'm coming speedily, hold to what you have that no one take your crown. This is bridal speak. You, we're so far removed that we think of it in terms of royalty, but that, that would have been in the background, but the first and foremost would have been bride. Ezekiel 16, thus you were adorned with gold and silver and your dress was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. This is a luxurious dress. Uh, it, we lose this because we can just buy cloth, any old how. But back then to have it embroidered, it took a lot of time and money. You ate fine flour, honey and oil and you were exceedingly pretty and became fit for royalty. Who, who's, who's the king? Yah. And he's saying you were fit for royalty, fit to become a queen. And your name went out among the nations because of your loveliness. For it was perfect by my splendor which I had put on you, declares the master. Yeah. Elohim is saying that Yisrael had become his queen, essentially. And she threw it in his face. Again, we know what happened. Spiritual adultery of the highest order. To the point where Yah had to divorce, divorce his bride. And Yah said to me in the days of Yoshia, who the sovereign, have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree and there committed whoring. And after she had done all these, I said, return to me. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister Yehuda saw it. And I saw that for all the causes which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Not like last week where men were just sending them away without the writ. This was a final thing. Yet her treacherous sister, Yehuda did not fear, but went and committed whoring too. And it came to, me, it came to be through her frivolous whoring that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and wood. But indeed, as a wife betrays her husband, so you have betrayed me, O house of Yisrael, declares Yah. Just, just as an aside, I've heard uh, some teachers within this movement, I won't mention the names, but you'd know them if I mentioned the names, that say that there's no bridal. Uh, all this uh, ancient Hebrew wedding stuff is all the traditions of men. Uh, it's all Jewish tradition. Like, first of all, it's not Jewish tradition. It's Hebrew tradition. And actually, this went on in nations other than Israel, this typology of the wedding. Secondly... It's everywhere. Yah's speaking in bridal terms. And this should become even more evident as we go through this. It's just, it, you know, it just frustrates me when people say, oh, it's just traditions. It's like, it, it might be a tradition, but Yah's clearly using it to give a point. Let's look at Numbers 5. The priest shall, this is speaking of the adulterous uh, bride. So if the husband is uh, suspecting that his wife is committing adultery behind his back, but there's no proof. The priest shall write these curses in a book and shall wipe them off into the bitter water and shall make the woman drink the bitter water that brings the curse. And the water that brings the curse shall enter her to become bitter. And the priest shall take of the grain offering of jealousy from the woman's hand and shall wave the offering before Yah and bring it to the altar. And the priest shall take a hand filled with the offering as it is a remembrance offering and burn it on the altar and afterward make the woman drink the water. 
And when he has made her drink the water, then it shall be, if she has defiled herself and has committed a trespass against her husband, that the water that brings the curse shall enter her and become bitter, and her belly swell, and her thigh shall waste away, and the woman shall become a curse among her people. If she hadn't committed adultery, she'd be fine. This was the cup that rightfully belonged to us. This is the cup that we are supposed to drink. This was the cup that our Messiah took upon himself. If, for those of you who have looked into the science of crucifixion, you'll see that Yeshua would have probably lost all the power in his legs. His belly would have swollen from the fluid building up in his heart and in his lungs. And going forward a little, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, please let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I desire, but as you desire. He took that cup and drank it so that we wouldn't have to. Which leads us to Romans 7. Or do you not know, brothers, for I speak to those knowing the Torah, that the Torah rules over a man as long as he lives. For the married woman has been bound by Torah to the living husband. But if the husband dies, she is released from the Torah concerning her husband. So then, while her husband lives, she shall be called an adulteress if she becomes another man's. But if her husband dies, she is free from that part of the Torah so that she is, no, she is not an adulteress having become another man's. So, my brothers, you also were put to death to the Torah of marriage, not to the Torah in general, through the body of Messiah for you to become another's, the one who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to Elohim. For when we were in the flesh, the passions of sins through the Torah were working in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been released from the Torah, the law of marriage, the law of marriage, having died to what we were held by so that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of letter. Both parties that were on the marriage contract have died. Messiah died, thus releasing the woman from the law of marriage. We, as we'll see, we died too. So the groom dies, thus releasing the woman. Ooh, easy. However, Yeshua as our high priest is forbidden from marrying a whore. At this point, only Messiah's died. Leviticus 21.9 is very clear. When the daughter of any priest profanes herself by whoring, she profanes her, fa- uh, her father. She is burned with fire, which is, by the way, why the wicked are thrown into the lake of fire. The Torah says so. If you're in spiritual adultery, you need to be thrown in, in the fire. Now, Leviticus 21 says that the high priest among his brothers, let him take a wife in her maidenhood, a widow or one put away or a defiled woman or a whore, these he does not take, but a maiden of his own people he does take as a wife, which means that Yeshua has to marry a virgin, a spiritual virgin. Therefore, the harlot, us, must die as well, that she may be raised a spiritual maiden. Paul speaks of this in 2 Corinthians 11. For I am jealous for you with a jealousy according to Elohim. For I gave you in marriage to one husband to present you as an innocent maiden to Messiah. So now both parties on the contract have died. Thus the contract, the two people are raised anew. Which means that the contract can now go on again. Therefore, the wedding is back on. Let's now put Yeshua in the center of this bit. All this was just to get us to this bit. This was all introduction. (laughs) Let's now look at how the marriage, the ancient wedding, Hebrew wedding ceremony, applies to our walk. The Shidduchin was the matchmaking stage. It was also the stage where the formal proposal occurred. How was the formal proposal accepted? There was a meal. Specifically, the father of the groom and the groom would come to the bride's father's house and they would knock on the door. If the door was opened, she'd accept it. In Revelation 3.20, see, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I shall come in to him and dine with him and he with me. This is covenantal talk. This is, will you accept my proposal? 
then would come the Erosine, the betrothal stage. Once the proposal had been accepted, the terms of marriage can now be set into place. Now, what are the terms and conditions of our marriage to Elohim? We, that we obey his commandments, the Torah. It was common that there were three copies of the ketubah. We covered this last week. One for the parents of the bride, one for the married couple, and a sealed copy for the judicial court. Now, in the same way, there are three copies of the Torah. There's here on earth, i.e. the Ark of the Covenant. There's up in heaven, because we've got the heavenly sanctuary, so everything that's here on earth, there's a copy up there. Where's the third copy? Yeah, I thought, on your hearts. Jeremiah 31, see the days are coming, declares Yah, when I shall make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehuda. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them out by the hand to bring them out of the land of Mitzrayim. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, declares Yah. For this is the covenant I shall make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yah. I shall put my Torah in their inward parts and write it on their hearts. And I shall be their Elohim and they shall be my people. The Ketubah also contained what the bride and groom's obligations to one another. It was part of all the stipulations. What would the groom promise his bride? What would we do to serve our groom? These are his promises to us. To him who overcomes, I shall give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of Elohim. He who overcomes shall by no means be harmed by the second death. To him who overcomes, I shall give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I shall give him a white stone, and on the stone a renewed name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. I was looking at this white stone thing, and in um, Roman culture, um, it allowed you access to certain places that other laity couldn't have. It was, this, uh, it was an honorary thing, which is really interesting. In Greek um, culture, it was when you'd been acquitted of a crime. You were given a white stone with your name on it. So you could say both of these factor in into our spiritual walk. And he who overcomes and guards my works until the end, to him I shall give authority over the nations, and he shall shepherd them with a rod of iron, as the potter's vessels shall be bro as the potter's vessels shall be broken to pieces, as I also have received from my father, and I shall give him the morning star. He who overcomes shall be dressed in white robes. What what kind of robes would you wear at a, a Hebrew wedding? White robes. It still goes on today in modern Jewish weddings. I shall by no means blot out his name from the book of life, but I shall confess his name before my father and before his messengers. He who overcomes, I shall make him a supporting post in the dwelling place of my Elohim, and he shall by no means go out. Who did anyone just get allowed to be in the dwelling place in the tabernacle? No. You, you would be stoned and shot through with an arrow. If you went, this is a sign of intimacy, privilege. And he shall by no means go out. And I shall write on him the name of my Elohim and the name of the city of my Elohim, the renewed Jerusalem, which comes down out of the heaven from my Elohim and my renewed name. To him who overcomes, I shall give to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. This is the king with his bride, king, queen. So what does it require from us? If you love me, you shall guard my commands. Yeshua answered him, if anyone loves me, he shall guard my word, and my father shall love him, and we shall come to him and make our stay with him. He who does not love me does not guard my word, and the word which you hear is not mine, but of the father who sent me. The, I find it hard to, uh, to uh, uh, hear people when they say, oh yeah, I love God, I love God, and it's like you don't do what he's asking of you. You know, this is the equivalent of my wife doing everything I hate and then saying, I love you, or the other way around. It wouldn't go down very well. It would be hypocrisy. Now, in Revelation, 
This is why I've used this picture as a background. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, having been sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong messenger proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loosen its seals? And no one in the heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. Now, when the ketubah, uh, there were three copies, right? One for the bride and the groom, one for the parents of the bride, and one for the judicial court. Who was allowed to open the one at the judicial court? Could anyone just open it? No. You had to be a judge. You had to have authority. Again, we're having this same kind of principle play out. And I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or even to look at it. And, for one of, and one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Yehuda, the root of David, overcame to open the scroll and to loosen its seven seals. A ketubah would have had seven signatures on it. And when you had a signature back then, you had a seal. that would have dripped wax and pressed it with a signet ring. The groom. Pardon? Did they not? Yeah. Interesting. I didn't know that. The groom would have signed it, obviously, as would the father of the groom. The bride would sign it, as would her father. The witness number one and witness number two. These are your two witnesses. And finally, the rabbi or the judge that would have overseen the whole ceremony. These are your seven seals, your seven signatures. Let's keep going with the erosine. Part of the ketubah stipulated the bride price, the dowry, as we would call it. Now, what was the price for us? Life. Yeah, I'm hearing murmurs. First Peter 1. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, pass the time of your sojourning in fear knowing that you were redeemed from your futile way of life, inherited from your fathers, not with what is corruptible, silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Messiah, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless. This is how we were paid for. This is how we were bought. Prior to the public betrothal ceremony, both the bride and groom would undergo mikveh, or immersion. Matthew 3.16, having been immersed, Yeshua went up immediately from the water and see the heavens were opened and he saw the spirit of Elohim descending like a dove and coming upon him. We must immerse ourselves. We have to undergo immersion. And we have to cleanse ourselves in the living waters of the word. Now, there is another baptism that is spoken of. Yeshua said to them, you do not know what you ask. The, the, the disciples have just asked, can, uh, can we sit at your left and at your right in the kingdom? And Yeshua says, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? We've covered this cup already. And be immersed with the immersion that I am to be immersed with. And they said to him, we are able. And Yeshua said to them, you shall indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the immersion that I am to be immersed, you shall be immersed. What is this other immersion that our Messiah is speaking of? I guess. Ian's smiling, which means he knows. He, Greg knows. I indeed immerse you in water unto repentance, John the Baptist. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to bear. He shall immerse you in the set-apart spirit and fire. What's fire in Scripture? Trials, tribulation. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he shall thoroughly cleanse out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the storehouse, but the chaff he shall burn with unquenchable fire. The baptism of fire. And it isn't this Pentecostal charismatic, let your fire rain down. You don't want Yah's fire to rain down on you. You just don't. (laughs) You laugh because it's true. Isaiah 48 verse 10, see I have refined you but not as silver. I have chosen you, Shiduchin, I've chosen my bride in the furnace of affliction. The bride will also be immersed with trials as our Messiah was. 
for you, O Elohim, have proved us. This being proven is melting metal, putting it through the fire, purifying it. You have refined us as silver is refined. There's a really neat thing with silver. The, to purify silver, you heat it, you heat it, you heat it. How does the silversmith know it's ready when it's pure? When he can see his own reflection in it. So when you're ready, Messiah should be able to look at you and go and see himself. When you're that pure. Yeah, all the imperfections come to the top and then they, they use the pipe to blow, or it's called the slag, I think, and they blow it all off and when it's pure enough, you can see your reflection in it. It's just a, we lose all these things because we, we don't smelt silver. <laughs> Proverbs 13, 3, a refining pot is for silver and a furnace for gold, but Yah tries the heart. We th- the, our, our modern English uh, translations will put test and you lose the translation. He's saying he's putting it through the refinery. Your heart. It's not just like a, a tick box. You're, you're going in for a heart judgment. Can man change someone's heart? No. Not only will the bride wear white garments, she will be righteous, she will have a pure heart. She will have to. The Ruach will have written his ways on our heart. Hopefully it will go from being up here down to here. You don't try and keep his ways. You just walk in them naturally. You breathe in them. Once the bride and groom have undergone mikveh, it is time for the betrothal ceremony. During the ceremony, the cup of wine of betrothal would be shared by the bride and the groom. Now, Luke 22, 20, likewise, the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the renewed covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. The groom would give the matan, the gift to his bride to signify his love for her and let her know that he was coming back for her while he was gone preparing a place for her. Now, Messiah gave gifts to his bride, but to each one of us, favor was given according to the measure of the gift of Messiah That is why he says, when he went up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. And he himself gave some as emissaries and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as shepherds and teachers for the perfecting of the set apart ones to the work of a service to a building up of the body of Messiah. Quite often we lose sight that these offices are gifts from our Messiah. He anoints people for the bettering of his bride. Until we all come to the unity of the belief and of the knowledge of the Son of Elohim, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the completeness of Messiah, so that we should no longer be children. Is Yah marrying a child bride? No. It was common for a a child to be betrothed, but consummation and uh, the wedding itself wouldn't occur until the bride was mature enough. If you're not spiritually mature enough, you're not the bride. Tossed and borne about by every wind of teaching, by the trickery of men in cleverness and to the craftiness of leading astray. I see this. J- just look online. Look on Facebook, look on YouTube. Everyone is being tossed to and fro, which is a sad state for the body. But maintaining the truth in love, we grow up in all respects into him who is the head, Messiah. Again, Messiah needs to be able to look at you and see his own reflection in you. From whom the entire body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the working by which each part does its share, causes growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. 1 Corinthians 12. And there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of services, but the same master. And there are different kinds of workings, but it is the same Elohim who is working all in all. Messiah has given his bride gifts that will help her mature into the perfect bride. He has given her gifts that will benefit and build up the body. Once betrothed, the bride and groom were legally married. So if you've accepted and you are walking in his covenant, walking and obeying his commands, and you, you have submitted to him, you are legally betrothed. Legally. 
the next stage for the groom was to go back to his father's house and prepare a place for her. Where's Messiah right now? He's preparing a place for you. By the way, once you're betrothed, what does it take for you to come out of that betrothal? A divorce. Now, we've already had one divorce, and he died, and we died, to rectify that problem. Now, in Hebrews, it says that Messiah doesn't die again. You don't get to crucify him over and over. So take this covenant seriously. There's already been one hiccup. There won't be another. In my father's house, there are many staying places or mansions, as our King James will put. And if not, I would not have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I shall come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you might be too. This is all bridal talk, when the husband will come and take his bride and bring her back home. And I shall take you as a bride unto me forever, and take you as a bride unto me in righteousness, and in right ruling, in kindness, and compassion. Note the similarities in language. Yeshua is saying, I shall come again and receive you unto myself. And then in Hosea, I shall take you as a bride unto me forever. I shall take you as a bride unto me in righteousness, right ruling, kindness, compassion. And I shall take you as a bride unto me in trustworthiness, and you shall know Yah. Again, people that want to say that there's no ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony, this is very hard to argue against. During the betrothal stage, the bride would consecrate herself to her husband. And this was called Kiddushim. Uh, this is where, uh, for those of you that do Kiddush, the bread and the wine, the sanctifying of Shabbat as it comes in, the woman would then become sanctified to her husband. She was set apart, betrothed. So whenever you see, you are set apart. We think of it as holy, this kind of ethereal, ah, oh, no, you're set apart to your groom. This is the inference. She would learn all about her husband and how to be a wife and a helpmate. How do we learn about our husband? You read the word. That he's given us what? Prophets, teachers, evangelists. Hopefully these people should be helping you have a deeper, intimate relationship with, the, with him, not with, you know what I mean? I don't want you guys to be having a relationship with me. I'm trying to hopefully give you depth of understanding on your groom. Exactly, help to eat, walk. Eat. This is why discipleship is so important. Because you can't do this alone. You just can't. You know, the people that say, oh, well, I have the spirit and he talks to me directly, that's great. Those people are usually whose life is a complete shambles as well. I mean, I'm just saying. She would have to prepare her wedding garments. She would have to make her wedding dress. We get illusions of this in Revelation. During this time, the bride and groom, they didn't see each other, but would send messages to each other through the friend of the groom. This, this is where we have the perfect analogy of when Avraham sent his servant to go find a bride for his son. It was the servant that did everything. John 14, 15, if you love me, you shall guard my commands and I shall ask the father and he shall give you another helper to stay with you forever. Again, people say that they're spirit filled and spirit led and are not walking in obedience. Yeshua is calling you out on your hypocrisy. It's, it's, it's literally that black and white. 15, 6, John 15, 16, And when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who comes from the Father, he shall bear witness of me. It's the teacher. The, the Spirit should be helping you know your groom. Hopefully when you read your scriptures, the Spirit should kind of connect the dots for you and give you them aha moments. John 16, 13 and 14. But when he comes, the spirit of truth, he shall guide you into all the truth. What is the truth? Your word is the truth. An everlasting truth. So again, people that are not walking in his covenant, in his commands, you are walking in falsehood. For he shall not speak from himself, but whatever he hears, he shall speak, and he shall announce to you what is to come. And he shall esteem me, for he shall take of what is mine and announce it to you. Again, 
the Spirit should be guiding us into our covenant. If you're not being guided in this covenant, you're in adultery. It, or you're at least lusting after an, and something else. Let's take a break here. And then in the second half, we'll start attaching this to all the Moedim, and especially uh, the future Moedim. Hopefully this kind of helps you see how our relationship with Messiah is, is just all bridal talk. It's all bridal talk. Amen. All right. Let's start putting the Moedim and the ancient Hebrew wedding model together. Uh, most of us know the basics and about the Moedim and the appointed times, uh, but we miss out this bridal aspect to it. The ceremonies of the ancient Hebrew wedding model can be divided into two parts predominantly. Uh, the Erosin, which is the betrothal, and the Nisuin, which is the marriage. Obviously, there's the precursor of that, the Shidruchin, where the match was made. But when the people were married, legally, there's two halves. Interestingly, the Moedim can be divided into two parts. The spring Moedim and the fall Moedim. The Moedim detail Elohim's plan of redemption. Most of us, you know, we know these things. Yet few see how the Moedim are linked to the ancient Hebrew wedding model. If I said um, Ian would be able to show me, but would you be able to tell me how this all fits into the Moedim? Most people wouldn't. Both of our Messiah's coming, so he came once already, we await him another time, are linked to both the Moedim and the ancient Hebrew wedding model. Most of us understand that the spring were to do with his first coming and the fall Moedim, the second coming, which is yet to occur. Again, there's a link to the Hebrew wedding model. So... I'm going to link the Erosin, the betrothal, to the spring Moedim, which is the first come in, and the wedding, the consummation, and all that aspect with the four Moedim. Let's actually start overlaying these things, because I'm making these statements. And so let's see what scripture says. So we have uh, Passover, unleavened bread, day of first fruits, and Shavuot. These are the spring Moedim, and we know that Messiah died on Passover. Buried unleavened bread day one, rose on first fruits, and on Shavuot, the spirit was poured out. Hence, we have the day of Pentecost, which leaves us with Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Sukkot. Now, we've already got, most of us will have ideas of what happens on these days. I get that. Um, but does the ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony actually shed light on these things? And I'm going to say, yes, it does. In fact, it will give you a deeper appreciation. And you'll see how all these things are interwoven. So, Erusin, let's recap. Bride and groom undergo mikveh, giving of the gift, the bridal from the groom to the bride, the signing of the ketubah, and the covenantal meal and cup of wine between the bride and the groom to say, we are now betrothed to one another. And then at the marriage, there was the groom coming to take his bride home, announced by his two witnesses and great shouts and shofars, the finalization of the vows and the cup of wine. And then there was the consummation and then the wedding feast. Matthew 26, 26, and as they were eating, Yeshua took bread and having blessed, broke and gave it to the taught ones and said, take, eat, this is my body. And taking the cup and giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood, that of the renewed covenant, which is shed for the many of the forgiveness of sins. What stage of the Hebrew wedding model is this? Yeah. The, the betrothal meal. How was the betrothal meal sealed? Uh, sorry, how was the betrothal? I've just said it there. The betrothal was sealed with a meal. So uh, bread and wine. It was very common when two parties made a covenant, they would share a meal together. Uh, this is why I said last week, this idea of when Paul and John say, do not break bread with those that call themselves believers or followers and yet uh, off doing sin in the background because it, it looks like you're making covenant with them. 
But I say to you, I shall certainly not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in the reign of my father. Now, if Messiah has just shared the cup of betrothal in this stage, he is saying that he will not drink of the fruit of the vine until it is done so in the kingdom. So yet to occur. What is the next cup of wine in the wedding model? If this is the betrothal one, what's the next cup? Marriage. This is the marriage cup. You sure the disciples would have got this because they were, it would, you know, it's a really good example is when I say to uh, someone, the day that the trees are, un- the presents are under the trees, you automatically know, oh, it's Christmas, right? For the, the disciples would have had this with the wedding stuff. So let's look now at the, we're going to look at all the thematic connections between the Moedim and the ancient Hebrew wedding model. So in Passover, Pesach, you have blood, which is equated to wine. Uh, Scripture shows us this. You drank wine, the blood of grapes. This is in the Song of Moses. The blood gave protection to the Israelites. And it was actually a type and shadow of being set apart. The, the, the Egypt, Israel was set apart unto Yah. Thus, there was protection But against any of the children of Israel, no dog shall move its tongue against man or against beast, so that you know that Yah makes distinction between Mitzrayim and Yisrael. This was the uh, the death of the firstborn. And this is what set Yisrael apart. It was the blood. Unleavened bread was to be eaten with the Passover meal. Go read it. You shall eat eat, uh, the Passover with unleavened bread and with uh, bitter herbs. So you have the eating of the meal itself. That is a sealing of a covenant. So this would have, I would argue, this is the betrothal meal. Remember that Yah was delivering his people out of Egypt. He was about to make them a a great nation and make covenant with them. Now, let's go to an aside. Four cups. During Passover, there's four cups, right, that we drink over the Passover ceremony. Now, these are based on the four times Elohim says, I will, or I shall. Say, therefore, to the children of Israel, I am Yah, and I shall bring you out from under the burden of the Mitzrites, and I shall deliver you from their enslaving, and I shall redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments, and I shall take you as my people, and you sh- I shall be your Elohim, and you shall know that I am Yah, your Elohim, who is bringing you out from under the burden of the Mitzrites. So this is what the four cups are based off. The first one is called the cup of sanctification. I shall bring you out from under the burden of the Mitzrites. Now, what was the initial... I oh, will cover it. The cup of judgment or deliverance. I shall deliver you from their enslaving. If you read the Passover Haggadah, it says that we were delivered through great judgments. The plagues were great judgments upon the Egyptians, but they were what actually delivered Yisrael. This should, you know, it should ring a bell for, you know, Judgment Day. Judgment Day is going to be bad news for a lot of people. It will be good news for others. Much like the, uh, the Jubilee. The whole Jubilee was, is all linked to that. The cup of redemption, I shall redeem you with an outstretched arm. Who redeems us? Yeshua's blood. Who's the right hand of Yah? Yeshua. I I love it. The cup of praise or restoration, I shall take you as my people and I shall be your Elohim. Now, in the ancient Hebrew wedding model, I can only find three cups of wine being drunk. You can only find three. The acceptance of the formal proposal, which is when I stand at the door and knock, they would open the door, they would share a meal. You have the betrothal cup, the formal ceremony where they become betrothed. Then the bride, uh, the groom goes off for a year, prepares a place, and then at the actual wedding, they share a cup to finalise the vow. This is where in the modern day they smash the glass to symbolize that nobody else will drink of the cup that we've just shared, the cup of marriage. This means that there's a missing cup. So these are the four cups of, um, in the Passover meal. 
which marriage cup corresponds to which Passover cup? So I would say the cup of sanctification is the acceptance of the formal proposal. This is when the bride became the husband. I accept your formal proposal. I'm set apart unto you. Sanctification. It means you, you, you belong to someone. The cup of redemption. This is where the bride price was paid. The husband would pay for the, for the bride to the father. What, what does it mean to be redeemed? What were we redeemed by? Well, we were redeemed by the blood of Messiah. So you were bought at a price. You are not your own. This is what Paul is referring to. The cup of praise. The wedding calls for joy. This was a great joyous occasion. So there's a cup. The cup of judgment is what's missing. The cup of missing from the ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony is the cup of judgment. Why? We covered it in the first half. Going forward a little, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I desire, but as you desire. Remember, the cup of judgment was was salvation for the Israelites, but it was judgment for the Egyptians. This was poured out on the Egyptians. Now, we have all come from spiritual adultery and, quote-unquote, Egypt. We were the adulterous bride. Therefore, we need to be receiving this cup of judgment, the cup that Messiah drunk, the cup that, you know, the bitter waters with the curses inside. All these things link to one another. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the rule of the authority of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also lived, once lived in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, as also the rest. We deserve these judgments. But Elohim, who is rich in compassion because of his great love, again, this love talk, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, even when we were out in Egypt, made us alive together with Messiah. By favor, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenlies in Messiah Yeshua in order to show in the coming ages the exceeding riches of his favor and kindness towards us in Messiah Yeshua. Elohim will only exalt a humble bride. So here it says he raises us up and he makes us sit with him in the heavenlies. This prompted me to think of this, what Messiah says in Luke 14. And he spoke a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, again, what are we talking about, a wedding feast? Do not sit down in the best place, lest one more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, give this one place. Then you begin with shame to take the last place. Rather, when you are invited, go and sit down in the last place so that when he who invited you comes, he shall say to you, friend, come up higher. Then you shall have esteem in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For everyone who is exalting himself shall be humbled and he who is humbling himself shall be exalted. Now, what, what are we going through right now? The baptism of fire. We're, going, we're trying to refine ourselves. Hopefully, this is humbling you. Hopefully, the process of the Ruach circumcising your heart is making you lowly, humble, meek, so that he can exalt you. You know, the bride didn't just choose to come up to the top of the table. Her husband would literally exalt his bride. He would say, this is my bride and exalt her in front of everyone else. In Revelation 11, when they have ended their witness, the bees coming up out of the pit of the deep shall fight against them. This is the two witnesses, and overcome them and kill them. And after the three and a half, to, three and a half days, a spirit of life from Elohim entered into them, and they stood up on, upon their feet, and great fear fell upon those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from the heavens saying to them, come up here. And they went up into heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. I would argue the two witnesses were so humble. They did what the master asked them. 
and they paid with their life for doing their 1260-day uh, prophecy. But they look at what the reward they got. The master says, come up here. They didn't exalt themselves there. He did it. Let's look at uh, unleavened bread. So unleavened bread is to be eaten all week. Again, a reference to the covenantal betrothal meal, I would say. We have bread, we have wine. We have the clearing of leaven from one's house. So leaven, which is hypocrisy, which is spiritual adultery. Uh, in, I think it's in Luke. Uh, you should says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There's the traditions of men, the, tradi- the traditions of uh, false religion. These are all the things we need to be getting out. And all these are forms of spiritual adultery. This is part of setting yourself apart unto your groom. It's a type of kiddushin, the bride being sanctified unto her husband. Apparently, we need reminding of it quite a lot. <laughs> Let's look at the day of first fruits. I actually... When I was putting this together, this was the one that kind of tripped me up because I could see all of the feasts in the wedding ceremony. Apart, This one took me a little bit more thinking. This was when the consecration of the... I've put the first fruits of the first fruits. So those who... Uh, if you look in the Torah, you had the wave sheaf offering. And then come Shavuot, you would have the bread of the first fruits, which would be made from the same batch as the sheaf. So this is the first fruits of the first fruits, essentially. Um, So you have this idea of dedicating something, dedicating yourself. We have the parable of the wheat and the tares. What's being dedicated? It is the day that the bride is accepted by the groom, I would say. And here's the verse to show you that. And he shall wave the sheaf before Yah for your acceptance. The priest would wave the sheaf for your acceptance. On the morrow after the Shabbat, the priest waves it. It's the day, it's the, it's the day they say, I do, essentially. But in the betrothal stage. Just as a groom would dress for the occasion, they didn't just turn up in their rags, so Yeshua rose from the dead in glory and esteem on first fruits. So he, he was quote unquote dressed for the occasion. The betrothal ceremony was only a small foretaste of the wedding ceremony that was to come. It was a first fruits, as it were. More is coming. This idea of, so again, the giving the sheaf, and then on Shavuot, you have the plenty of the barley harvest. Let's look at Shavuot. Is everyone seeing the connections? I'm not just plucking them out of thin air. The day that the ketubah was spoken and signed, and I'm talking of Mount Sinai here, this was the day the ketubah was officially given. It was the day that the ruach was given to help us write the ketubah on our hearts, the conditions of our marriage. The day that the groom gave gifts to his bride through the Spirit, as a pledge that he would return for her. He gave, you know, the Spirit gives us the gifts of, uh, the gifts of ministry, but also, you know, prophecy, speaking in languages, all these things. Let's look at the day of trumpets. Now, so, we've covered the spring Moedim. This is what already occurred. This is what we're now awaiting for. The day of shouting and shofars being blown. If you Yom Teruwa, it doesn't mean day of trumpets. It means day of noises, shout, trumpets, just make a noise. The day that no man knows the day nor the hour. Now, why is trumpets called the day that no man knows the day or the hour? Well, why, what specifically happened that you had to wait and watch for? The, the moon. You had to wait for the moon. It was, it, this was day one of the lunar month. You didn't know. You, you, you had a two-day window, basically. You knew roughly when it would be. Just as Yeshua says, you should be able to see the signs come in and know that the time is near. But you don't know the exact day. It was the, this is how the groom would reply, by the way, when people would ask him when the wedding day is. Who gave the groom the go-ahead? For the wedding. His father. 
So when people would ask the groom, well, when's your wedding day? He says, I don't know. Only my father knows. He's the one that sends me. No man knows the day nor the hour. Only my father knows. <laughs> but concerning that day and the hour, no one knows. Not even the messengers of heaven, but my father only. He's, he's, re- he's referencing Yom Teruah and bridal talk in the same s- statement. Let's remember that the groom would get his bride when his father gave the command that he was ready. The groom didn't decide. When the groom came for his bride, there was a great procession of joy, jubilation, and shofar blasts. The bride would actually, and this happened at night, remember, the bride would actually see the light of the procession in the night and have to go out and meet her groom because he would come for her, but she would have to go out and meet him. I love this idea, draw near to me and he shall draw near unto you. But she would see the light and go towards it, which is really amazing. Again, it, I believe this is a reference to the moon. It's a type and shadow. The word nisuin, the, the wedding, means to take, coming from the root naso, which means to lift up, which is where Paul elucidates on this in 1 Thessalonians 4. For this we say to you by the word of the master that we, the living who are left over at the coming of the master, shall in no way go before those who are asleep. Because the master himself shall come down from heaven with a shout, a great noise, with the voice of a chief messenger, with the trumpet of Elohim, and the dead in Messiah shall raise first. So you've got your hint to Yom Teruah there, shouting the trumpets. Now, when the groom used to come, the two witnesses would go forth and say, behold, the groom is coming. They they would be announcing his coming. Then we, the living who are left over, shall be caught away, lifted up, together with them in the clouds to meet the master in the air, so we shall always be with the master. It was customary for the groom's witnesses to head up the procession and announce his coming. Behold, the groom is coming. We see this in Matthew 3. In those days, Yohanan the Immerser came proclaiming the wilderness, in the wilderness of Yehuda, saying, repent, for the reign of heavens has come near. He's announcing. For this is he who was spoken by the prophet Yeshua, who is saying, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of Yah, make his path straight. So it shall be in Revelation at the end of days, and I shall give unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1,260 days clad in sackcloth. What do you think they're saying to people? Repent. Why? For the kingdom is near. Again, it's the same story. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that are standing before the Elohim of the earth. That's another teaching in of itself. Let's look at Yom Kippur. Spilling of blood occurred. Lots of blood. Lots and lots of it. It was the day of judgment. It's when uh, your fate was sealed. That's it. There was no repentance. Between uh, trumpets and uh, Yom Kippur, that's your final window. Then the books are sealed. I would say that this speaks of the consummation between bride and groom. You were just thinking that. Blood. What, what was supposed to happen when the bride and groom consummate? I'm not trying to be graphic here. There was supposed to be a proof of virginity. Blood. This will be the day when the groom will find out if his bride is a virgin or not. She will be judged. It was, think about it. A sentence is pronounced. Will she be a spiritual virgin or will she not? It's a form of judgment. What happens if the bride back in the day wasn't a virgin on the night? Pick up your stones, right? 2 Corinthians 11, 2, we covered this. For I am jealous for you with a jealousy according to Elohim. For I gave you in marriage to one husband to present you as an innocent maiden to Messiah. So let's go back to Leviticus 21. We read this again in part one. The high priest among his brothers, let him take a wife in her maidenhood. 
a widow or one put away or a defiled woman or a whore, these he does not take, but a maiden of his own people he does take as a wife. And I looked and I saw a lamb standing on Mount Zion with, one, with him 144,000, having his father's name written upon their foreheads. They are those who were not defiled with women, for they are maidens. They are those following the lamb wherever he leads them on. They were redeemed from among men, being first fruit to Elohim and the lamb. This is speaking of spiritual adultery. And in their mouth was found no falsehood, for they are blameless before the throne of Elohim. So let's look at how this links to Joel 2. Joel 2 says, blow a ram's horn in Zion and sound an alarm in my set-apart mountain. I'm going to put forward, this is um, Yom Teruah, the warning. Let all the inhabitants of the earth tremble, for the day of Yah is coming, it is near. This is why... Judgment Day was Yom Kippur. So we have a trumpet being blown before the Day of Judgment. This is Yom Teruah. The Day of Yah is near, a day of darkness, gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains, a people many and strong, like who, the whom the like of whom has never been seen, nor shall they ever be again after them, to the years of many generations." And then it goes on to describe an army, which is the locust. But then it says, blow a ram's horn is Zion. So it's a, a, blow, a horn being blown after the first initial one. Set apart a fast. Call an assembly. What day was there fasting and the blowing of a trumpet? Yom Kippur. Gather the people, set the assembly apart, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babes, let a bridegroom come out from his room and a bride from her dressing room. Now, the word for the groom's room is cheder. Cheder refers to the private apartment of the groom. It's his, it's his bedroom, his sanctum, as it were, his innermost chamber, that only he, and it's where the marital bed was, and a bride come from her chuppah. What was over the marital bed? The chuppah. The, this is a bride, and I'm, I'm going to put forward that the consummation has occurred. Judgment has occurred. The bride was found a virgin. And they're now coming out of that room, Yom Kippur. Let the priests, servants of Yah, weep between the porch and the altar. Let, this idea of weeping on Yom Kippur was common because you, you were weeping for all your sins. You were praying that Yah would forgive you. They would be praying that Yah had forgiven Israel as a nation on that day. Let them say, spare your people, O Yah, and do not give your inheritance to reproach. For the Gentiles to rule over them, why should they say among the peoples, where is their Elohim? Let's look at the chuppah. Because this word is actually in scripture. It's there in Joel. I love this one. This is Psalm 19. It's a really poetic. It's speaking of uh, the heavens that are proclaiming the esteem of El and the firmament is declaring the work of his hand. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech and there are no words. Their voice is not heard. I believe this is um, a hint of the Maserat. If you understand the Maserat, you will understand the plan. There's, the plan of salvation is given in the stars. I'm not talking astrology, by the way. Their line has gone through all the earth and their word to the end of the world. In them, he set up a tent for the sun. And it is like a bridegroom coming out of his room, coming from his chuppah. It rejoices like a strong man to run the path. It's equating the sun coming out in glory. As it's equating it to a bridegroom coming out of the marital room saying, yes, yes, it was a glorious, joyous occasion. Its rising is from one end of the heavens, its circuit to the other end, and nothing is hidden from its heat. This was a glorious moment. And in Isaiah 4, in that day, the branch of Yah shall be splendid and esteemed, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for the escaped ones of Yisrael, the preserved ones, the branches. 
And it shall be that he who is left in Zion and he who remains in Jerusalem is called set apart, everyone who is written among the living in Jerusalem. When Yah has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and rinsed away the blood of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning, I would argue that this is telling you when this is occurring. Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur was the one day that everybody was clean. They were clean in the eyes of Yah. And he does it by the spirit of judgment. Again, it's, this is judgment day. Then Yah shall create above every dwelling place of Mount Zion and above her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the esteem shall be a covering. It shall be a chuppah. Now, this, what's this speaking of? The cloud of smoke by day and the flaming of fire by night. It's, it's the exodus, it's the tabernacle, that it was above the tabernacle. It's saying that in the kingdom, every dwelling will be like a dwelling place of Yah. This is intimacy, intimacy with the king. And it will be like a covering, like a chuppah. It's all bridal talk. And the booth, a sukkah, for a shade in the daytime from the heat, for a place of refuge, and for a shelter from storm and rain. What happens after Judgment Day? What, what comes next in the sequence after the Day of Atonement? Sukkot. This is why you see chuppah and sukkah, and it's speaking of the kingdom. It is on Yom Kippur that the bride will be pure. Our high priest will only consummate with his bride when she is without spot or blemish. When the consummation occurred, the bridegroom would come out with the proofs of virginity and rejoice. Thus, the wedding feast could begin. Seven days of partying. What comes next is Sukkot, our seven-day feast. After this, I looked and saw a great crowd, which no one was able to count, out of all the nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, dressed in white robes, in bridal wedding garments, and palm branches in their hands. When do you wave your palm branches? At Sukkot. And crying out with a loud voice, saying, Deliverance belongs to our Elohim, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the messengers stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped Elohim, saying, Amen, the blessing and the esteem and the wisdom and the thanksgiving and the respect and the power and the might to our Elohim forever and ever. Amen. Sounds like a very joyous occasion. And one of the elders res responded, saying to me, who are these dressed in white robes and where do they come from? And I said to him, Master, you know. And they, he said to me, These are those coming out of the great distress, having washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Does everyone get to have their garments cleansed by the blood? 1 John chapter 1, around 5 and 6, The blood only cleanses you if you walk in the light. If you walk in the light, then the blood cleanses you. Because of this, they are before the throne of Elohim and serve him day and night in his dwelling place. Again, this is intimacy. Not anyone could just rock on up to the temple and go in and serve. He who sits on the throne shall spread his tent over them. Does this ring a bell maybe from earlier? And it, in Ruth, it came to be at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself and saw a woman lying at his feet. And he said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your female servant. Now you shall spread your covering over your female servant, for you are a redeemer. He's spreading his tent. He, he, the groom only spreads his skirt or tent over his bride. This is not everyone. And I heard as the voice of a great crowd, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunder saying, Hallelujah, for Yah El Shaddai reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him praise, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife, she has prepared herself. While the groom was away, she made her dress. She learned all about him. She wrote his Torah of the house on her heart. 
And to her it was given to be dressed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the set-apart ones. And he said to me, Write, blessed are those who have been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of Elohim. Now, Isaiah 25, this one's amazing because it should ring a bell. In this mount, and in this mountain, Yah of hosts shall make for all the people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of old wines. I'm interested now, old wines. <laughs> of choice pieces with marrow, of old wines, well refined. Again, this idea that, you know, Messiah didn't drink, we were talking about this in the break. And he shall swallow up on this mountain the surface of the covering which covers all people and the veil which is spread over all the nations. What happens in a wedding ceremony? What does the groom do to the bride? He he lifts the veil off. And he shall swallow up death forever. And the master Yah shall wipe away every tears from all faces and take away the reproach of his people from all the earth. For Yah has spoken. We think of the wiping of the tears as a way from the book of Revelation. It's quoted from Isaiah. And it shall be said in that day, see, this is our Elohim. We have waited for him. How long did a bride have to wait for a groom? One year, sometimes more, sometimes seven. She's waited for him and he saves us. This is Yah, we have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his deliverance. So we've covered the Moedim. We had the Pesach, Passover, which is when Messiah died, which was the wine of the covenantal meal. Hag Hamatzot, the unleavened bread, Messiah buried, which would have been the bread of the covenantal meal, of um, betrothal. Then you had first fruits, which is where Messiah was risen, the consecration and acceptance of the bride. You know, the, the sheaf was waved for the acceptance of the people. Then we had Shavuot, which is when the spirit was poured out, which is the giving of the bridal gift from the groom to his bride. Then we have Yom Teruah. Yeshua returns. The groom would take his bride and lift her up. Literally, this is what's going to happen. Yom Kippur, judgment day, consummation. The bride will be found a virgin. Sukkot, the wedding feast. Eight, seven days of partying, which, what's next in the sequence? There is another one. The last great day, Shmini Atzaret. People lump Sukkot and Shmini Atzaret together. They're two separate feasts. Now, were all of these fulfilled one after the other in chronology in the spring? It was. One after the other in the same year. One after the other. Yeshua died, rose again, and then Shavuot. If that's the pattern, is that how it's going to occur with the full Moedim? Absolutely. You're going to have the snatching up of the bride. You're going to have judgment day, the balls of wrath poured out. And then you will have the great celebration. So what, where does um, the eighth great day fit into all of this? I would say that this is day one of the millennium. In chronology, if they're being fulfilled one after the other, is day one, is the start of the millennium. It's life as a husband and wife begins. What happened after the seven-day feast? You go home. Now, I'm not taking away the, the, the typology that it can refer to the forever after, the eighth day after the millennium. It, it, you can do that, but people miss this, that if you're looking at the literal chronology, the wedding feast has occurred, the, the, the bride and the king start ruling from Zion. This is day one of the millennium. So let's look at Shemini outside. How will the kingdom be? The spirit of the master Yah is upon me because Yah has appointed me to bring good news to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives and the opening up of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yah and the day of vengeance of our Elohim to comfort all who mourn. So when's the day of vengeance? Yom Kippur. What is the acceptable year of Yah? We've covered this before. It's the Jubilee. When was the Jubilee announced? 
Leviticus 25. It was announced on Yom Kippur. You shall sound a great shofar and announce the jubilee. This is it occurred on Yom Kippur. So this is speaking of the jubilee release to appoint to those who mourn in Zion to give them embellishment for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And they shall be called trees of righteousness, a planting of Yah to be adorned. So if you're weeping on Yom Kippur, you would obviously, by the time of Sukkot, you're you're, you're rejoicing, you're joyous, you've been forgiven. You've been, hopefully you've been found a spiritual virgin. And they shall rebuild the old ruins, raise up the former waste, and they shall restore the ruined cities, the waste of many generations. This is speaking of the kingdom. Now people have this idea that the first few days of the kingdom is going to be bliss and roses falling out of the sky and joy. It's going to be derelict. We're going to be rebuilding. When Yeshua comes down and touches the Mount of Olives, what happens? Right? It's going to be chaos. The wrath has been poured out. It says in one of the prophets that we will be clearing the land of dead bodies for seven months and getting rid of the bones, which actually means that the the millennial temple will not be built until after the initial... Anyway, that's another story. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the foreigner be your plowmen and your vine dressers. This is when Yisrael rules the world. But you shall be called priests of Yah, servants of our. Where do the priests work? In the temple. This is, again, intimacy. You shall consume the strength of the Gentiles and boast in their esteem. Instead of your shame and reproach, they rejoice a second time in their portion. Therefore, they take possession a second time in their land. Everlasting joy is theirs. For I, Yah, love right ruling. I hate robbery for burnt offering. And I shall give their reward in truth and make an everlasting covenant with them. Jeremiah 31, the spirit writing his laws on our hearts. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed Yah has blessed. Who's ruling from Zion? Yeshua. Who's ruling with him? His bride. This is where the parable of the talents comes in. You know, the master comes back. How have you done with what I've given you? And the account in Luke's, uh, the guy says, I've, you gave me five coins, I, I've given you five more. He says, well done, put him over five cities. Depending how well you do here, it depends how much you rule in the next stage. I greatly rejoice in Yah, my being exalts in my Elohim, for he has put on garments of deliverance of me. Garments of salvation, garments of the, the Hebrew there says Yeshua. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. What color is that robe? White. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and a bride adorns herself. Again, bridal talk. It's everywhere. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the seed to shoot up, so the master Yah causes righteousness and praise to shoot up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I am not silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I do not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her deliverance as a lamp that burns. And the nations shall see your righteousness and all the sovereigns your esteem. And you shall be called by a new name which the mouth of Yah designates. So what did we read earlier of in the bridal stuff that the bride is exalted by her husband? What happens to the name of the bride when she marries? It gets changed. You shall be called by a new name. Why? Because you've been married. You are now called by your husband's name. And you shall be a crown of comeliness in the hand of Yah and a royal headdress in the hand of your Elohim. No longer are you called forsaken. No longer is your land called deserted. But you shall be called Chefitzba, and your land married. For Yah shall delight in you, and your land be married. This idea that Yah takes joy in his people, that's really humbling for me to think about. When you start 
you know, dwelling on that, that he takes joy in his people. For as a young man marries a maiden, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your Elohim rejoice over you. Again, people that want to say that it's all tradition and don't listen to it, it's everywhere in scripture. Yah is speaking through bridal covenant. Once the great wedding feast of the Lamb has taken place, the millennium will begin. The king will rule from Zion with his bride. And he who overcomes and guards my works until the end, to him I shall give authority over the nations, and he shall shepherd them with a rod of iron. As the potter's vessel shall be broken to pieces, I, as I also have received from my father. I hope that helps you see the wedding covenant in the feasts. The reason that we even started doing this series is because Passover is approaching. So that when you are drinking from the cup of wine, I want you guys to realize that you are drinking the cup of betrothal. You are looking forward to the day when you will drink it again anew in the kingdom, having been found a spiritual virgin. Amen.